Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we are discussing the masterpiece that is Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light. It feels quite glib to call this a masterpiece because maybe that word has become a little bit perhaps overused, a bit hackneyed, but this is really one of the most, this is the culmination of really one of the most extraordinary pieces of work ever in literary history. This is of course the third part of Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell trilogy that started with Wolf Hall and can, continued up with Bring Up the Bodies. This book was released in 2020 and I remember when it was released there was continual observation in any review that this was a shoe in for the Booker Prize. It didn't happen, Hilary Mantel didn't get her holy trinity of uh, Booker Prizes because she was robbed. Um, but not because this book wasn't extraordinary, but I think because I feel the judges wanted to move on with new names. But don't let that dissuade you because The Mirror and the Light is breathtaking in its brilliance and its originality. So let's quickly surmise where we are. So the, if you don't know what happened to Thomas Cromwell, um, apologies for this, but this isn't a particular, um, I'm not really blowing the ending for you. So Thomas Cromwell is the chief advisor to Henry VIII. At the end of Bring Up the Bodies, Anne Boleyn, the woman that he had accompanied um, and machinated to become the second wife of Henry VIII, has just been executed. In this trilogy, we're therefore left with Thomas Cromwell, an upset king, and a need to find a third bride and an heir to the throne. For those who um, perhaps are not that familiar with Thomas Cromwell or British history, what's so extraordinary about these books, the three of them, is that Hilary Mantel has given us a character, a three-dimensional character that evokes sympathy. Thomas Cromwell is was routinely acknowledged as a bit of a criminal, a bit of an eminence grease, a bit of an arch manipulator. He was seen as the force behind the throne. And what Hilary Mantel wanted to do was bring us a lead character, a protagonist that evoked sympathy, but also evoked horror. This is, of course, a man who grew up as a boy in immense poverty in Putney, the son of a blacksmith, who rose to the highest power and um, accumulated great wealth under Henry VIII before he too fell foul of the king and ended up executed in the Tower of London in 1540. That's where the book's going to end, by the way. But despite the fact that we know the ending, what the greatest achievement of this book is, well, actually, there are two greatest achievements. The first is that, that there is suspense and tension in this book, despite the fact that we all know that the execution of um, Anne Boleyn is going to lead to Thomas Cromwell's fall. So we had the rise in Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. This book is about Thomas Cromwell's fall. This is not a straight line. There is so much tension and suspension as the... Um, as the court starts to work against Thomas Cromwell and then there are sudden shoots of opportunity. You feel that the King and Thomas Cromwell are still seeing eye to eye. Thomas Cromwell never seems to lose the support of the King. So you sort of think, well, how is he going to end up in the tower? Because they still seem so close, the King and his chief advisor. And then you sort of see the sort of the machinations, the power, the sort of conversations in the shadows of the royal court. And how is Thomas Cromwell going to outmaneuver them again? It's all a bit of a chess game. Um, and that really is that you can get so much suspension for, let's be frank, it's a pretty chunky book, uh, is amazing. The second achievement of this book is that it is totally unexpected. Uh, Bring Up the Bodies was a very uh, tightly woven plot, nuanced, uh, you could feel a bit of a thriller going on, you know, how's, how's the king going to get rid of Catherine, how's Anne going to play, how are they going to get their way to the top? What this feels like, interestingly, is, and there was an interesting observation, I think, by Hilary herself in a lecture she gave some years back. I think someone asked her whether she writes ghost stories, and she quickly said yes, and she used a quote by St. Augustine, and it was that I say it's a famous quote, I'm going to get it wrong. Ghosts are just, in. St. Augustine said, ghosts are just invisible, they are not absent. And that is the atmosphere of this book. So for all the court intrigue, all the weight of um, fear and opportunity, what you also have is the weight of history and the calling of the ghosts that have gone before um, uh, Thomas. Some, of course, were executed at his own manipulation of the king. Um, 
Some of them were his enemies. Some of them, of course, was his famous patron, uh, Cardinal Wolsey. And their ghosts are ever present in this book. You feel that the separation between life and death, between this world and the next, is very porous in this book. There's a sense of coming full circle. There's a sense of Thomas um, seeing uh, seeing what's coming, which is part of the intrigue about this title. Is the mirror and the light is a is a famous uh, saying that was given to Henry that you know he is a king is the mirror and light of all the kings that have gone before him. Uh, but also in here, it's nuanced in another way. The mirror was a word that was carved into Anne Boleyn's sword that she was executed by. But the light is also another word for the other side or God. You know, you move towards the light. And there is a sense of that in Thomas Cromwell that Hillary has given us. This is a man who risked an awful lot, risked everything for the ultimate payoff, but actually was his spirit lost? And um, does he get that back at the end? But it's, um, it's ex I mean, Hillary Mantel takes my breath away. Everything in here is nuanced. One of the interesting uh, developments that's happened as we study Henry VIII now is not seeing him as a crazy fat king that murdered a third of his wives but also to see him for the sociopath that he was and so how Hillary brings him to life in a nuanced character how we see Henry change how we see the supporting cast change the dukes in the court Chapuis uh, the imperial ambassador it um, you know Thomas Thomas Kramer everything here every supporting character is invested invested in um, Everyone is, has a plot, has their own ambition, has their own focus, has their own plan. And it's all sort of about whether Thomas Cromwell can weave against them. It's an extraordinary book. Hilary Mantel is an extraordinary writer, despite the fact that it is, what, 900 pages? I flew through this. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing book. However, I advise that you cannot, should not read this book as a standalone. It is the culmination of Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies, Mirror and the Light. Uh, and it is much more in the style of Wolf Hall, a little bit more languid. The scenes are uh, reflective, considered, uh, whereas Bring Up the Bodies was more tightly plotted. This is much more in the uh, sense of Wolf Hall, in that feel, where we're moving through corridors of power, where we're seeing people reveal and hide themselves. Uh, but it is fantastic. Um, I would recommend it wholeheartedly, but the fact is, if you've already got through Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies, you already know how Hilary Mantel is as a writer. She is uh, at a level that no one else is writing at. Her craft is phenomenal, and to read this, I was never expected to be moved by the story of Thomas Cromwell. But that really is Hilary's achievement, isn't it? The Mirror and the Light, robbed of the Booker Prize, but still one of the greatest achievements of literature in the 21st century. Mirror in the Light by Hilary Mantel.